Hi, third graders. Um, it's time for the next chapter in Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Uh, if you'll recall, you know, Eustace had gotten out of being a, a dragon, which was very exciting, and he came out of it a little bit better for it. Uh, they had a couple of narrow escapes, one with a sea serpent that tried to sink the ship, and then they landed at a place where they discovered that the water turned things into gold, including, it turns out, one of the seven lords that they were uh, looking for had met his fate there. Um, so this is chapter IX, chapter nine, The Island of the Voices. You're gonna love this one. And now the winds, which had so long been from the Northwest, began to blow from the West itself. And every morning when the sun rose out of the sea and curved the curved brow of, prow of the dawn treader, stood up right against the middle of the sun. Some thought the sun looked larger than it looked from Narnia, but others disagreed. And they sailed and sailed before a gentle yet steady breeze and saw neither fish nor gull nor ship nor shore. The stores began to get low again and it crept into their hearts that perhaps they might have come to a sea which went on forever. But when the very last day on which they thought they could risk continuing their eastward journey dawned, it revealed right ahead between them and the sunrise, a low land lying like a cloud. They made harbor in a wide bay about the middle of the afternoon and landed. It was a very different country from any they had yet seen, for when they crossed the sandy beach, they found it silent and empty, as if it were an uninhabited land. But before they were level, before them were the level lawns in which the grass was as smooth and short as it used to be in the grounds of a great English house where 10 gardeners were kept. The trees of which there were many all stood well apart from one another, there was no broken branches, no leaves lying on the ground. Pigeons sometimes cooed there, but there was no other noise. Presently there came a long, straight, sanded path, not a weed growing on it, and the trees on either hand. Far off on the other end of the avenue, they now caught sight of a house, very long and gray and quiet looking in the afternoon sun. Almost as soon as they entered this path, Lucy noticed that she had a little stone in her shoe. It's the in an unknown place, it might have been wiser for her to ask those others to wait while she took it out, but she didn't. She just dropped quietly behind and sat down to take off her shoe. Her lace got into a knot. Before she had undone the knot, the others were a fair distance ahead. By the time she'd extracted the stone and was putting the shoe on again, she could no longer hear them. But almost at once she heard something else. It was not coming from the direction of the house. What she heard, was a thumping. It sounded as, as if a dozen strong workmen were hitting the ground as hard as they could with great wooden mallets, and it was very quickly coming nearer. She was already sitting with her back to a tree, and as the tree was not one she could climb, there was really nothing to do but sit dead still and press herself against the tree and hope that she wouldn't be seen. Thump, thump, thump. Whatever it was must be very close now, for she could feel the ground shaking, but she could see nothing. She thought the thing, or things, must be just behind her. But then there came a thump on the path right in front of her. She knew that it was on the path, and not only by the sound, but because she saw the sand scatter as if it had been struck by a heavy blow. But she could see nothing that had struck it. Then all the thumping noises drew together around 20 feet away from her and suddenly ceased. Then came the voice. It was really a dreadful, it was really very dreadful because she could not see anybody at all. The whole of that park-like country stood, looked as quiet and empty as it had looked when they first landed. Nevertheless, only a few feet away from her, a voice spoke. And what it said was, Mates, now is our chance. Instantly, a whole chorus of other voices replied, Hear him, hear him, now's our chance. He said, well done, chief. You never said a truer word. What I say, continued the voice, is get down to the shore between them and their boat and let every mother's son look to his weapons. Catch them when they try to put out to sea. Ah, oh, that's the way, shouted the other voices. You never made a better plan, chief. Keep it up, chief. You couldn't have made a better plan than that. Lively then, mates, lively, said the first voice. Off we go. Right again, chief, said the others. Couldn't have a better order, just like we were going to say ourselves. Off we go now. Immediately, the thumping began again very loud at first, but soon fainter and fainter till it died out in the direction of the sea. 
Lucy knew there was no time to sit puzzling as to what these invisible creatures might be. As soon as the thumping noise had died away, she got up and ran along the path to the others as quickly as her legs would carry her. That They must, at all cost, be warned. While this had happened, the others had reached the house. It was a low building, only two stories high, made of beautiful mellow stone, many windowed and particularly covered with ivy. Everything was so still that Eustace said, I think it's empty. But Caspian silently pointed to the column of smoke which rose out of one of the chimneys. They found a wide gateway open and passed through it into a paved courtyard. And it was here that they had their first indication that something was odd about this island. In the middle of the courtyard stood a pump and beneath the pump was a bucket. There's nothing odd about that, but the pump handle was moving up and down and there seemed to be nobody moving it. There's some magic at work here, said Caspian. Machinery, said Eustace. I do believe we've come to a civilized country at last. At that moment, Lucy, hot and breathless, rushed into the courtyard behind them. In a low voice, she tried to make them understand what she had overheard. When they had partially understood, even the bravest of them did not look very happy. Invisible enemies, muttered Caspian, and cutting us off from the boat. This is an ugly furrow to plow. You've no idea what sort of creatures they are, Lou, said Edmund. Well, how can I, Ed, when I couldn't see them? Did they sound like humans from their footsteps? Well, I didn't hear the noise of feet, only voices, and this frightful thudding and thumping, like a mallet. I wonder, said Reepa Cheep, do they become visible when you drive a sword into them? Looks as if we shall find out, said Caspian, but let's get out of this gateway. There's one of the gentry at the pump listening to all we say. They came out and went back into the path where the trees might be po might possibly make them less conspicuous. Not that it really does any good, really, said Eustace, trying to hide from people you can't see. They might be all around us. Now, Drinian, said Caspian, how would it be if we gave up the boat for lost, went down to another part of the bay, and signaled the Dawn Treader to stand in and take us all aboard? There's no depth for her, sire, said D Drinian. We could swim, said Lucy. Your majesties all, said Reepicheep, hear me. It is folly to think of avoiding an invisible enemy by any account of creeping and skulking. If these creatures mean to bring us to battle, be sure that they will succeed. And whatever comes out of it, I'd sooner meet them face to face than be caught by the tail. I really think Reep is right this time, said Edmund. Surely, said Lucy, if Rince and the others on the Dawn Treader see us fighting on the shore, they'll be able to do something. But they won't see us fighting if they can't see any enemy, said Eustace miserably. They'll think we're just swinging our swords in the air for fun. There was an uncomfortable pause. Well, said Caspian at last, let's get on with it. We must go and face him then. Shake hands all around. Arrow on the string, Lucy. Swords out, everyone else. Now for it. Perhaps they'll parlay. Let's find a piece. It was strange to see the lawns and the great trees looking so peaceful as they marched back to the beach. When they arrived there and saw the boat lying where it had let, they had left her and the smooth sand with no one to be seen on it, more than one doubted whether Lucy was not merely imagining all that she had told them. But before they reached the sand, the voice spoke out of the air. No furthers, masters, no further now, it said. We've got to talk to you first. There's 50 of us and more weapons than our fists. Hear him, hear him, cried the chorus. That's our chief. You can depend on what he says. He's telling you the truth he is. I do not see these 50 warriors, observed Reepa Cheep. That's right. That's right, said the chief voice. You don't see us, and why not? Because we're invisible. Keep it up, chief, keep it up, the other voices said. You're talking like a book. They couldn't ask for a better answer than that. Be quiet, Reep, said Caspian then added in a louder, louder voice, you invisible people, what do you want with us? And what have you done to earn, what have we done to earn your enmity? We want something the little girl can do for us, said the chief voice. The others explained that this is just what they would have said themselves. Little girl, said Reepa Cheep, this lady is a queen. Oh, we don't know about queens, said the chief voice. No more we do, no more we do, chimed in the others but we want something that she can do. What is it? asked Lucy. If it is anything against her majesty's honor or safety, added Reepicheep, 
you will wonder to see how many we can kill before we die. Well, said the chief voice, it's a long story. Suppose we all sit down. The proposal was warmly approved by the other voices, but the Narnians remained standing. Well, said the chief voice, it's like this. This island has been the property of a great magician, time out of mind. And we are all, or perhaps in a manner of speaking, I might say we were, his servants. We got, well, to cut a long story short, this magician that I am speaking about, he told us not to do something we didn't like. You know, he told us to do something we didn't like. And why not? Because we didn't want to. Well, then the same magician, he fell into this great rage, for I ought to tell you that he owned the island and wasn't used to being crossed. He was a m terribly downright, you know. But let me see, where am I? Oh, yes. Ah, yes. This magician, then, he goes upstairs, for you know he kept all his magic things up there, and we all lived down below. I say he goes upstairs and he puts a spell on us, an uglifying spell. If you saw us now, which in my opinion you may thank your stars you can't, you wouldn't believe what we looked like before we were uglified. You wouldn't really. So there we all were, so ugly we couldn't bear to look at one another. And what did he do then? Well, I'll tell you what we did. We waited till we thought the same magician would be asleep in the afternoon and we crept upstairs to go to his magic book, as bold as brass, to see what we could do about this uglification. But we were all in a sweat and a tremble, so I don't won't deceive you. But believe me or believe me not, I do assure you that we couldn't find anything in the way of a spell for taking off the ugliness. What with time getting on and being afraid that the old gentleman might wake up any minute. It was all a muck sweat, I won't deceive you. Well. To cut a long story short, whether we did right or whether we did wrong, in the end, we did see a spell for making people invisible. And we thought we'd rather be invisible than go on being ugly as all that. And why? Because we like it better. So my little girl, who's just about your little girl's age, and a sweet child she was before she was uglified, though, now at least soon said, but least said, soonest mended, I said, my girl, she says the spell, for it's got to be a little girl or else the magician himself, if you see my meaning, otherwise it won't work. Why not? Because nothing happens. So my gypsy said, I ought to have told you she reads beautifully and that there were that we were all invisible as you could wish to see. And I do assure you that it was a relief not to see one another's faces, but at first anyway, but the long and the short of it, he keeps talking about shortening the story, but he doesn't. But the long and the short of it is, we're mortal tired of being invisible. And there's another thing, you never reckoned on this magician, the one I was telling you about before, going invisible too. We haven't seen him since. We don't know if he's dead or if he's gone away or if he's just been sitting upstairs being invisible and perhaps coming down and being invisible there. And believe me, it's no matter of use listening because they always did go about with bare feet, making no more noise than a big cat. I'll tell you all, gentlemen, straight. It, it's getting to be more than our nerves can stand. Such was the chief voice's story, but very much shortened because I've left out all the other voices said, what the, and they said. Actually, he never got out more than six or seven words without being interrupted by their agreements and encouragements, which drove the Narnians nearly out of their minds with impatience. When it was over, there was a great long silence. But, said Lucy at last, What's all this got to do with us? I don't understand. Why, bless me if I haven't gone out and left out the whole point, said the chief voice. That you have, that you have, roared the other voices with great enthusiasm. No one could have left it out cleaner and better. Keep it up, chief, keep it up. Well, I needn't go over the whole story again, began the chief. No, certainly not, said Caspian and Edmund. Well then, to put it in a nutshell, said the chief voice, we've been waiting ever so long for a nice little girl from foreign parts like might be you, Missy, that would go upstairs and go to the magic book and find the spell that takes off the invisibleness to say it and say it. We all swore that the first strangers that landed on this island, having a nice little girl with them, I mean, for if they hadn't, it would be another matter. We wouldn't let them go away alive unless they had done what is needful for us. That's why, gentlemen, if your little girl doesn't come up to scratch, it'll be our painful duty to cut all your throats. Merely in this way of business, as you might say, no offense, I hope. I don't see all, all your weapons, said Reaper Cheap. Are they invisible too? The words were scarcely out of his mouth before they heard a whizzing sound and the next moment a spear had struck 
quivering in one of the trees behind them. That's the spear it is, said the chief voice. That it is, chief, that it is, said the others. Couldn't have put it better. It came from my hand, said the chief voice. They get visible when they leave us. But why do you want me to do this, asked Lucy. Why can't one of your own people? Haven't you got any girls? We durstn't, we durstn't, said the voice. We're not going upstairs again. In other words, said Caspian, you're asking a lady to face some danger which you daren't face. Ask your own sisters and daughters to face. That's right, that's right, said the voices cheerfully. You couldn't have said it better. Ah, you've had some education you have. Anyone can see that. Well, of all of the outrageous, began Edmund, but Lucy interrupted. Would I have to go upstairs at night or would it be in daylight? Oh, daylight, daylight, to be sure, said the chief voice. Not at night, no one's asking you to do that. Go upstairs in the dark, Oh, All right then, I'll do it, said Lucy. No, she said, turning to the others, don't try to stop me. Can't you see it's no use? There are dozens of them there, we can't fight them. And the other way, there is a chance. But a magician, said Caspian. I know, said Lucy, but he mayn't be as bad as they make out. Don't you get the idea that these people are not very brave? They're certainly not very clever, said Eustace. Look here, Lou, said Edmund. We really can't let you do a thing like this. Ask Reap, I'm sure he'll say just the same. But it's to save my own life as well as yours, said Lucy. I don't want to be cut to bits with invisible swords any more than anyone else. Her Majesty's in the right, said Reap a cheap. If we had any assurance of saving her by battle, our duty would be very plain. It appears to me that we have none. And the service they ask of her is in no way contrary to Her Majesty's honor, but a noble and heroic act. If the queen's heart moves her to risk the magician, I will not speak against it. And no one had ever known Reepicheep to be afraid of anything. He could be say this without feeling at all awkward. But the boys, who had all been quite afraid quite often, grew very red. Nonetheless, it was very obvious sense that, what, that they had to give in. Loud cheers broke out from the invisible people when their decision was announced, and the chief voice, warmly supported by all the others, invited the Narnians to come to supper and spend the night. Eustace didn't want to accept, but Lucy said, I'm sure they're not treacherous. They're not like that at all. And the others agreed. And so, accompanied by an enormous noise of thumping, which came louder as they reached the flag flagged and echoing courtyard, they all went back into the house. The next chapter is The Magician's Book. Hope you've enjoyed it.